So we're here in The Hague. I'm speaking with Dr. Robert Kahn. He is the chairman, CEO, and president of the CNRI. So, uh, Bob, can you just tell us a little bit about uh, DOA, the Digital Object Architecture, and how that might impact uh, the future Internet? Well, it's really going to be up to others uh, who might adopt it to really say what the future impact will be. But okay. <clears throat> my intent when I did this work uh, was to find a way to actually form a basis for thinking about managing information in the Internet. Okay. When we started out originally, I mean, the Internet was about moving information from one place to another. And the protocols enabled that. It wasn't about the networks. It wasn't about the computers. It wasn't about the applications. It was about getting the bits where they were supposed to go right. without the user being encumbered by knowing where to go, what networks to use, what protocols to use, and the like. <clears throat> We've now moved into a world where information is really why people use the nets. Yeah. They want to access it, and there are various ways that you can imagine that happening. Um, but the approach that we took is to say, let's, let's find a basis for doing it so that no matter what kind of information you're dealing with, the same architectural principles can apply. And so this architecture, as opposed to communication these days, which is based on packets, uh -huh. is based on digital objects, which okay. are sequences of bits or sets of such sequences with a unique persistent identifier. And those bits can be anything. It could be financial information, health information. It could be uh, a movie. It could be chip designs, anything that is of interest to you as a user or a creator of that information in the first place. Okay. So with these digital objects, um, in principle, you need a way to access them. Now, they could be coming to you over the airwaves, in which case they're just going to show up, but they could be stored somewhere. The architecture calls for them to be available from repositories. Right. Repository okay. is simply a place where you give an identifier, it gives you the object back. On the other hand, if everybody in the world adopted one of these, you could have a very large number, trillions, quintillions of repositories. Every cell phone, every PC could have one of these for storing these objects. Okay. Which of those do you go to? Given an identifier, you don't want to try every one of them. Yeah. So we created a resolution system, which says, Given an identifier, you ask the system about, like a card catalog, state information about this object. Like, where on the internet might I find it? It might be in 10 different places, uh, or just one. Uh, how do I know what uh, the terms and conditions are for use? You can't do that today easily on, let's say, the web or any of the current systems. How do I authenticate what I got? If this is a purportedly a law passed in some country at some time. How do I know this is the correct law? There right. isn't a future version of it. Um, maybe it's needed for security purposes, so all I want is a public key because I've got an identifier for you as an individual which maps into information about you. Okay. Public key is clearly one of them, but it may be other contact information. So that's the essential part of the system with these objects, but it assumes you have an identifier, and a resolution system in a way to then get it. On the other hand, if you don't know these identifiers, you know, 10 years from now or whenever, there could be a much larger number of these uh, identifiers than, than even people now imagine. Yeah. I don't know, 10 to the 5th, 10 to the 100th. Right. Huge numbers. You're not going to remember them all any more than we remember IP addresses today. Right. So another part of this architecture is a, a registry which contains metadata about the objects. And presumably, you go into these and search. The initial implementations were based on keywords, but you can easily imagine new algorithms being developed for recognizing faces or sounds or whatever and searching more broadly based right. on the metadata. Okay. So those are the components. And the only thing I would point out is that because repositories need storage for the objects um, the, the, and because those repositories may need to know what's in them, they need registries and likewise because registries need storage to keep the metadata records, the merge of those two seem natural and so we've demonstrated that uh, essentially one architecture for the registry repository can be used for either purpose okay. or both. Alrighty. Okay, so it's a, it's a real uh, big vision, grand scheme uh, about uh, being able to, to access uh, information. 
Um, but clearly there, there's likely to be an impact on, on the way that information is, is moved about and an impact on, on the networking architecture that, that's underneath it. So what, what kind of impact that might this have, for example, on, on, on routing and how, um, uh, how that works currently? How, 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 might, how might routing be impacted? Well, routing is one example. I mean, you could actually route on identifiers if you wanted, and we're not, we're not proposing that the basis of networking be changed. Okay. So, um, but you know, if you wanted to send information to a book, one possibility is you could route based on the identifiers of the book, or you could map the identifiers into IP addresses for more traditional routing, or okay. whatever you felt like. But the more important part uh, is that you can actually, with an identifier for these objects, take an object that you've never seen before, of a type that you've never seen before, and find out what it is that you need to know to, to communicate that object effectively somewhere else right. or okay. within the net. And when it's received at the other end, what the receiver needs to do with that in order to make use of it the way in which it was intended. Right. There may be parts that need to be presented right away, other parts that need to be stored, uh, there could be all kinds of different approaches to actually dealing with these objects. Historically, we've had no way to do that on the fly. You'd have to do it ahead of time, or you'd have to insulate the parties so that they didn't violate any laws that might otherwise apply. Okay. But I think you can now do these things dynamically, and I think that's going to change the way things work in, in the future. And so people need to have a clear understanding that the fact that things are the way they are today doesn't mean they have to stay exactly that way in the future. Right. Small changes can sometimes produce big positive effects. Okay. So the, the overall architecture that, that you're talking about here, is this something that's uh, proprietary or is it um, open or standardized? It's, it's open. Uh, it's a de facto standard. I mean, the resolution piece has been on the internet for over 20 years. It's okay. widely used in the publishing industry. I mean, even if you look back at other things that are standardized, like the TCP IP protocols, they weren't standards for the first while. We were building a community, people were using it, and eventually when people depended on it enough and it had stabilized, then you put it through a standards mechanism, and we helped to create some of those standards processes ourselves. Um, there are small pieces of what I'm talking about that need to be tightly controlled for standards purposes, but again, open to everybody to use. And all the things that you can do with it have to be done in the wider context of the community of users. So I think you know, virtually every standards body around will find some part of it that they can focus on. If it's a networking piece, it'll be done here. If it's a mobile piece, it'll be done here. If it's the wireline right. piece here. If it's a device piece, it'll be done here. If it's a literary piece here. If it's in this industry here, right. here and so forth. But I think uh, the only part of it that would be standardized, uh, that's architecturally core, are just the minimal things that make the architecture itself understandable in all these different domains. Okay. So can you give us an example of some uh, digital objects that, that might be uh, sort of unusual to, to today's internet, for example? Well, the kinds of information that's communicated today um, falls into a few categories that people have developed over the years. They might view it as an email message or a document of some sort in some word processing program, or it might be a streaming video of some sort. We tend to know what these things are, and ahead of time, we can figure out what to do with them. But something might show up in the future, structured as a digital object, the likes of which you had never seen before. Right. For example, uh, I, I would say maybe it's a map. So you want to understand where you are in some place, and you just want to bring it up on your cell phone. But you want to be able to interact with the map. So you want to be able to maybe ask it a question, like uh, where are the nearest such and such, or how do I do this, or what's the name of that street? And it isn't quite obvious, so maybe the way this was structured and sent to you was as, as a display version okay. that you would want to be up on your screen instantaneously, and it wouldn't have to be necessarily displayed sequentially. It could be put up on the screen however it shows up because the eye will integrate if it's done quickly enough. 
And maybe for you know a megabyte of real data that goes on your screen, or maybe it's 10 megabytes, there might be a terabyte of data that comes explaining the map. Right, right. Well, you don't want to wait for the terabyte to show up, so you can start looking at the map. Meanwhile, the other information is coming in at whatever its pace is, and maybe it can be answered if you ask late enough, or maybe you can't. But how would the sender of that know what to do if right. they had never seen one like that before? Yeah. So there needs to be some kind of a way to find out dynamically, what are the instructions for sending this? What are the instructions maybe for processing it in the net? This is okay to throw away, but that's not. If there's congestion, you can deal with it. You don't have to figure it out in advance. And when it shows up at the receiver, you'd like the protocols at the receiver to be able to receive this and know what to do with the information. Today, right. it's all very structured. Um, the people who have implemented TCP IP basically said, okay, let's pretend that's a virtual circuit. So whatever it is that shows up, we'll wait for everything in sequence and then send it to some appropriate application. Maybe the application doesn't need everything. Right. Maybe it can take it out of sequence. There's no way to say that today. There's no way for the programs to say to the protocol, here's what we need. Yes, yes. And I think with this, the use of this architecture embedded with networking, you know, the networks and the senders and the receivers can actually interrogate these identifiers to figure out what to do with the information. And okay. in fact, if you then pop populate the information around the globe in some effective way, there's no need to even send it around the globe. If it really is a terabyte and you have it positioned in the country in which you're at, which is entirely possible, then all you need to do is send the identifier. And right. you can pull out the terabyte of information. Maybe you send the, the graphic stuff so it displays more quickly, but you get a choice of how to deal with that. It could make a very big difference in how networks work in the future. Okay. So uh, we've talked about uh, identifiers or, or handles of the, the objects. Um, now, could these or might these in the future re replace the, the current uh, uh, de name, name system that's currently in place with the, the internet as we know it? They're really intended for different purposes. Um, I mean, we've never taken the position that we are trying to displace the DNS. <clears throat> the DNS was something that I you know, selected you know, in like 1983 or something. We had developed it before so that people didn't have to remember IP addresses. Yeah. So it was sort of the semantic component. And so you resolve a DNS name and domain name and you get back essentially an IP address. You may find out who's administering it, but basically it's a one of mapping. Uh, whereas with the digital object identifiers, these are more at the level of like an IP address, except it's at a higher level in a sense because you're actually identifying the information itself, but you're not giving it a name. I mean, there's no semantic component to what we've done. Right. Okay. So, and that was an important part of the design philosophy to keep the semantics out of it. Now, if somebody wants to name, you know, a particular digital object Fred or Phil or something, they're free to do that, but the system doesn't want to know about that as an intrinsic system any more than the internet routers want to know about domain names. Right, right. Those domain names are used to map into IP addresses. The internet does everything based on IP addresses. So there's not a one-to-one -one equivalence. And I think the DNS is going to be around for a while, uh, perhaps even a long time, because it serves a useful function right now, and it is widespread and embedded. But I think we need to move beyond that to the point where we're actually managing information resources. And the DNS is really not used to identify informational resources right. okay. directly. So finally, Bob, can you just uh, tell us a little bit about the, the Donor Foundation, D-O-N-A, um, what that is and, and how this is relevant to the, the DOA and the future of the internet? Well, as we were unveiling the architecture and many people around the globe were using it for either research or experimental purposes, many people concluded it could be used to more official kinds of activities, whether they're governmental activities, company activities, things that have more than just research kinds of uh, interests. And um, the question was raised as to how could they rely on it if it was only rooted in the United States. We were running the root of the identifier system. Right. 
We've had these problems uh, show up in the past. Yeah. Uh, for, you know, for many years, people were concerned about the fact that ICANN uh, was rooted in the US. Many people thought it ran the internet, which it really doesn't, no. but didn't want to have that issue again. And we were told by many parties that you know, if, if they were to use the system, it could not be rooted in an organization in the US. Okay. They wouldn't accept it. And so we looked at what the alternatives were, and after examining a number of them, it con we concluded that the only really viable alternative was to base it in a foundation in Geneva, neutral country. Okay. And the purpose was really um, several fold. One, to be responsible for the evolution of the architecture, so it would have a basic focus, that uh, it would manage or at least administer the root of the, the identifier system, uh, and that it would reach, reach out to others, uh, pilot projects, maybe material to explain it. It will have very limited focus, uh, and, and eventually the board of the foundation decided that it should be responsible for standardizing those key aspects of the architecture that only it really could, could maintain. Right. So uh, the foundation was established in early 2014, so it's almost three years. Oh, okay. Uh, it's got a currently a nine-member board that's distributed around the globe, multi-stakeholder. Uh, it's uh, responsible for, for selecting organizations that can administer the root of the uh, system. Okay. So the foundation doesn't actually provide a direct operational role to the community at large but they empower organizations around the globe. The intent is to have about 12 of them initially. Right now we're up to five, about to become seven, and I think maybe we'll have 12 within the next year or two. Um, and so the user community then deals with those administrators who have a carved out little piece of the namespace, but they cooperate with each other so that uh, whatever they're administering at the very top level is shared with everybody else securely. Right. And then the, they empower others to create uh, parts of the identifier system which contain the actual records. So if you're in one country and, and you empower a bank in that country, the bank would have its records, so the government might have its records, and so forth. So it's a really interesting distributed uh, approach to how to run not only the uh, resolution system, but also to manage the architecture going forward. So right. far, it's been pretty well received. Okay, excellent. All right, well, thanks for explaining uh, the, the, whole, the whole concept and, and why it exists and what it could achieve. It's, it's complex, but yet it's meant to be so simple and could have a great impact on, on information access and information management and distribution in the future. Just like the internet. It's, it's, really, it's really simple until you look more deeply. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Bob, thank you very thank much. You very thank much. you. My pleasure.